well, that's a very tough act to follow. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very grateful to Mike. What he didn't say is, is that I, I couldn't have started A World on Fire uh, without him. I, I went to see him 12 years ago and explained what I wanted to do, and he, he was incredibly helpful. and gave me lists and names and took me through the archives, and, and he, he really set me on the road. And then afterwards, when he hadn't heard from me, um, all those years, I, I wrote to him and said, you, you have probably forgotten me, but um, I, I've now finished, <laughs> and I'd be very grateful if you could please read. At that point, it was a 350,000-word manuscript. Um, it's now shorter, you'll be happy to hear. Um, could you please read it and, and give me your comments? And, and he did every line and gave me marvelous comments, and so he really is, to me, a great hero. So thank you very much, Mike. So the title of my talk to you today is, is Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, uh, a Propaganda Tool to the Enemy? Uh, question mark. It, is, it is well known how much controversy surrounded President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation after the Battle of, of Antietam. Who can forget the words of John Hughes, Archbishop of New York, who warned, quote, we Catholics have not the slightest idea of carrying on a war that costs so much blood and treasure just to gratify a clique of abolitionists in the North, unquote. But, but less well-known or understood is the controversy that the proclamation attracted abroad. Both Union and Confederate supporters in Britain try to use it as a propaganda tool, and in the beginning at least, it was the Confederates who benefited the most. The reasons for this were laid down at the start of the war, when England was still pondering its response to the conflict. A poem in Punch magazine on the 30th of March, 1861, neatly expressed Britain's cotton dilemma. Quote, though with the North we sympathize, it must not be forgotten that with the South we've stronger ties, which are composed of cotton. The revelation of the London Times journalist, William Howard Russell, that the South hoped to exploit these ties, along with his poignant descriptions of slave life, provoked outrage in England when his reports started to appear in April. But the North gained less support than Southerners feared once Britons also learned that President Lincoln had promised not to interfere with slavery in his inaugural address. The British attitude in general dismayed the US ambassador, Charles Francis Adams, quote, people do not quite understand Americans or their politics, he wrote to his son, Charles Francis Adams. They think this is a hasty quarrel. They do not comprehend the connection which slavery has with it because we do not at once preach emancipation. Hence, they go to the other extreme and argue that it is not an element in the struggle, unquote. But Adams himself was guilty of mischaracterization. The English reaction was far more complicated than he allowed. Even the North's two biggest supporters in Parliament, the radical MP Richard Cobden and his colleague John Bright, believed that Lincoln had made a mistake by not abolishing slavery at the outset. A leading abolitionist, Richard Webb, complained, neither Lincoln nor Seward has yet spoken an anti-slavery syllable since they took office. This was true for Seward, who had specifically instructed all US ambassadors and consuls to avoid mentioning the word in connection with the Union. The deliberate omission was a grievous miscalculation in regards to Britain. Seward had sacrificed the North's trump card in the country, hoping it would appease the South. Instead, he had provided ammunition to his critics, who accused the North of hypocrisy. The Economist magazine declared, quote, the great majority of the people in the northern states detest the colored population even more than do the southern whites." Unquote. Yet, for all the finger-pointing and public criticism of the north, the first southern envoys in Britain, William Lowndes Yancey and Ambrose Dudley Mann, failed to make the slightest change to Britain's policy. Quote, we are satisfied that the government is sincere in its desire to be strictly neutral in the contest, Yancey told the Confederate governments, quote, and will not countenance any violation of its neutrality, unquote. 
And writing to a friend in the South, Yancey admitted that the mission was not turning out the way he had envisioned. Quote, in the first place, important as cotton is, it is not king in Europe. Furthermore, he added, the anti-slavery sentiment is universal. Uncle Tom's cabin has been read and believed. However, not long afterwards, the British learned that Lincoln had rejected General Fremont's Emancipation Proclamation in Missouri. Regardless of the problems at home, abroad, Lincoln's rebuke played into the Confederates' hands. Without the slavery issue, the North was simply a country fighting a rebellion in its nether regions. Quote, look at the Southerners here, Henry Adams, the younger son of Adams, wrote indignantly on the 25th of October, 1861. Every man is inspired by the idea of independence and liberty while we are in a false position, unquote. A speech by the Liberal Chancellor of the Exchequer, William Gladstone, to an audience in Manchester in April 1862 revealed the extent to which ambiguity over the slavery question benefited the South and damaged the North. Quote, there was no doubt, he declared, if we could say that this was a contest of slavery and freedom, there is not a man within the length and breadth of this room, there is perhaps hardly a man in all England who would for a moment hesitate upon the side he should take, unquote. Gladstone felt vindicated after he received a letter from a Liberian diplomat named Edward Wilmot Blyden, who declared that he was, quote, very glad of the position which England maintains with reference to the war. Both sections of the U.S. are Negro-hating and Negro-crushing, unquote. The South's chief propagandist in England, a journalist from Mobile named Henry Hotz, used every opportunity to blast the message that the war was about independence, not about slavery. Hotz was able to convince Britons that the new Anglo-American Slave Trade Treaty, which allowed the British Navy to search suspected American slave ships, and the bill abolishing slavery in Washington itself were just window dressing. As proof, he pointed to the fact that Lincoln had failed to win support from the border states for a gradual emancipation bill. Then came the reports of the terrific slaughter at Antietam, which horrified the British. But just as shocking to them was Lincoln's emancipation proclamation. As Seward had feared from the outset, the proclamation was widely denounced as a cynical and desperate ploy. Charles Francis Adams understood its symbolic importance, but even pro-Northern supporters could not understand why Lincoln had allowed the border states to keep their slaves, unless the emancipation order was directed against the South rather than slavery itself. Quote, our people are very imperfectly equated with the powers of your federal government, explained the anti-slavery crusader George Thompson to his American counterpart, William Lloyd Garrison. Quote, they know little or nothing of your constitution, its compromises, guarantees, limitations, obligations, etc. They are consequently unable to appreciate the difficulties of your president, unquote. The pro-Northern magazine, The Spectator, declared itself to be disappointed with the proclamation. Quote, the principle is not that a human being cannot justly own another, it insisted, but that he cannot own him unless he is loyal to the United States. <laughs> For the radical MP, Richard Cobden, the moral contradiction proved, quote, that the leaders in the federal government are not equal to the occasion, unquote. Henry Hotz successfully planted propaganda stories and articles in the press which portrayed the proclamation as a ploy to encourage race riots or, at the very least, force Southern soldiers to return to their homes to protect their families. Punch magazine depicted Lincoln as a desperate gambler who was using the proclamation as his last card. The Times even accused Lincoln of inciting the slaves in the South to kill their owners, imagining in graphic terms how the president, quote, will appeal to the black blood of the African. He will whisper of the pleasures of spoil and of the gratification of yet fiercer instincts. And when the blood begins to flow, 
and shrieks come piercing through the darkness. Mr. Lincoln will wait till the rising flames tell that all is consummated and he will rub his hands and think that revenge is sweet." Unquote. The effect of the proclamation on the British cabinet, which was already debating whether it had a moral duty to stop the bloodshed, was almost, almost catastrophic. Two of its leading members, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Russell, and William Gladstone, became convinced that a humanitarian crisis was at hand. For Gladstone, the combination of his worries about the suffering of the Lancashire cotton workers and his disgust with the apparent hypocrisy of the Emancipation Proclamation pushed him over the edge. On the 7th of October, the day after the proclamation appeared in the Times, he made a speech in Newcastle in which he proclaimed, quote, we may have our own opinions about slavery. We may be for or against the South. But there is no doubt that Jefferson Davis and other leaders of the South have made an army. They are making it appear as a navy. They have made what is more difficult than either. They have made a nation. That speech was telegraphed all over Europe almost before Gladstone had sat down. The Confederate envoy Dudley Mann in Brussels wrote to Richmond that same night. This clearly foreshadows our early recognition. Two years after the conclusion of the war, in 1861, Gladstone admitted his mistake. Quote, I had imbibed, conscientiously, if erroneously, an opinion that 20 or 24 millions of the North would be happier and would be stronger without the South than with it, and also that the Negroes would be much nearer to emancipation under a Southern government than under the old system of the Union, he wrote. At the time, however, Gladstone had not been alone in his confusion about the slavery question or in assuming that Southern nationhood was around the corner. A few weeks after his speech in Newcastle, the Confederate commissioner in England, James Murray Mason, attended a banquet given by the Lord Mayor in the city of London. Quote, When my name was announced by the mayor, it was received with a storm of applause, Mason wrote in his diary. He was invited to address the hall and elicited loud cheers each time he referred to the commercial ties between the city and the south. A, th a southern supporter who had been among the guests and heard these speeches was convinced that he had witnessed a momentous event. Quote, I was at the mansion house last night, the supporter wrote afterwards, and heard the Lord Mayor virtually recognize the South in the quietest and most inoffensive way that could be imagined. As I came out, I rubbed shoulders with Captain Tinker, Grinnell's partner, and I said jocularly, well, you see, the Lord Mayor's been and gone and done it. And he laughingly replied, oh yes, it's all over now, depend on it. This expression of opinion from the heart of England's middle classes must tell it will reverberate through the land and find an echo, unquote. Well, of course, Captain Tinker and Gladstone were wrong. There was no echo, either in the cabinet or through the land. Antietam and the Emancipation Proclamation notwithstanding, the cabinet agreed that England should remain neutral. And once the proclamation became law, without spawning any massacres of Southern whites, British public opinion also began to alter in its favor. An increase in the number of potential army volunteers calling at the American embassy reflected this changing perception of the war. Quote, applications for service in our army strangely fluctuate, wrote the assistant secretary to the embassy, Benjamin Moran, on the 14th of January, 1863. For some time past, they have been but few since the announcement of the president's determination to adhere to his emancipation policy, they have again become numerous, and today we've had a French and a British officer seeking employment, unquote. Another surprise was waiting for Moran when he went to church. The vicar had never mentioned the war before, but, quote, on this Sunday, he announced during prayers, our hearts in this great contest are with the North, and this was answered by a deep amen from the congregation, unquote. 
The US consul in London, Freeman Morse, also noticed the change since Lincoln's proclamation. Quote, emancipation meetings continue to be held in London every week, sometimes four or five a week, at some of which two and 3,000 people have been present, and in a majority of cases, unanimously with the North. Other portions of the country are following the example of this city and holding meetings with about the same result, he reported to Seward. The largest emancipation meeting of them all took place at Exeter Hall on the 29th of January, 1863. Henry Adams managed to secure a seat at the meeting and was thoroughly uplifted by the experience. The politicians, Henry told his brother afterwards, were going to have to listen to their constituents or risk being thrown over. Pro-Southern supporters, such as the Liverpool businessman James Spence, now began to find it much harder to convince audiences that the South would also abolish slavery as soon as it won independence. Lincoln scored a further propaganda coup by sending a personal letter to the working men of Manchester, thanking the cotton workers for their patience and sacrifice. Whatever misfortune may befall your country or my own, he declared, the peace and friendship which now exist between the two nations will be perpetual. Jefferson Davis's silence on the same matter of slavery now spoke volumes. Even though some veteran abolition campaigners like Bishop Samuel Wilberforce and Lord Broome remained unconvinced, much to Henry Hotz's glee, uh, the proclamation had finally succeeded in linking the cause of emancipation with a united America. The hitherto pacifist British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society changed its stance and became actively involved in the counter-propaganda war, secretly supplying the US Embassy with information about Confederate activities in the financial markets. There was also a rise in pamphlets and books putting forward the case for the North. The economist, for example, John Eliot Cairns, published his attack on the South called The Slave Power right after the Emancipation Proclamation. Cairns was followed by the actress Fanny Kemble, who published her diary, Journal of a Residence on a Georgian Plantation in 1838-39, written during her exile on her former husband's slave plantation in Georgia. William Howard Russell went next with an account of his stay in America entitled My Diary, North and South, which verified many of her observations. The spectator journalist Edward Dicey followed with the travel log, Six Months in the Federal States, which tried to correct many of the distortions and caricatures about Northern culture that pro-Southern journalists had propagated. The growing sense that the North was committed to abolition had just as big an effect on Southern supporters in England as it did on Northern supporters. The Confederates were horrified by the efforts of James Spence to propose an emancipation proclamation to Jefferson Davis. Quote, I almost dread the direction his friendship and devotion seemed to take, Henry Hotz confessed to the Confederate Secretary of State, Judah Benjamin. Spence had been so inspired by the proclamation that he was convinced the South should issue one of her own. Hotz was outraged by the idea, but unsure how to divert him without exposing the truth. In the end, Benjamin was forced to fire Spence as the South's official financial agent in England. Determined to regain the moral high ground on the slavery question, Hotz managed to pull off the extraordinary feat of persuading a religious publishing house to include in every publication, religious and non-religious, a southern pamphlet entitled Address to the Christians Throughout the World. Signed by the 96 clergymen of Richmond, the address urged fellow Christians to protest against Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Hotz estimated that it was read by two million people. Yet, even that signal success failed to stem the tide created by the proclamation. Hotz's troubles with James Spence and others mirrored those of the Confederate commissioner, James Mason, with his Tory party allies. They too tried to extract a pledge from him that the South would renounce slavery once independence was achieved. 
camouflaging the South's total dependence on slavery was the only way that Mason and John Slidell were able to persuade the veteran abolition campaigner Lord Shaftesbury to give them his support. Even then, the relationship almost founded when Shaftesbury asked in all innocence, quote, if the Confederate president could not in some way present the prospect of gradual emancipation, such a declaration coming from him unsolicited would have the happiest effect in Europe, unquote. The Confederate commissioners insisted that abolition was an, was an issue for the individual states to decide, not Richmond, which provided an answer, but not the answer to Lincoln's procl proclamation. However, fortunately for Henry Hotz, the Confederates finessing of the slavery question was enough to convince James Spence so much so that he continued to propagandize on their behalf, despite being relieved of his official position for being anti-slavery. But the bulk of the population proved to be less gullible, and increasingly, the Confederates had to turn to more outrageous methods to stop the emancipation message. During the summer of 1863, when Parliament debated the question of Southern recognition for the last time, the Confederate lobby went all out in its propaganda efforts. Londoners found Waterloo Station placarded with posters depicting the British Union Jack crossed with the Confederate flag. Hackney cab drivers were encouraged to display the same emblems in miniature. Hotz was working at a feverish pace, distributing posters, placards, and circulars up and down the country. The Morning Herald and Standard newspapers were persuaded to print editorials demanding recognition every other day until the actual debate at the end of June. But James Spence had a much harder time connecting with the general public. For this final push in Parliament, he set up two separate organisations. One was a respectable club called the Manchester Southern Club, whose purpose was to distribute Confederate material in the north of England. The other was his, was his own private army of agitators. The group, among other things, successfully broke up an abolitionist meeting at the Manchester Free Trade Hall. Quote, These parties are not the rich spinners, but young men of energy with a taste for agitation but little money, Spence wrote to Mason. Quote, it appears to my judgment that it would be wise not to stint money in aiding this effort to expose Kant and diffuse the truth. Manchester is naturally the center of such a move, and you will see there are here the germs of important work, but they need to be tended and fostered. I have supplied a good deal of money individually, but I see room for the use of 30 or 40 pounds a month or more, unquote. As Spence soon discovered, breaking up a few abolition meetings was not going to affect the debates in Parliament or change the growing perception that the South was not prepared to tackle the slavery question. Now, there were, of course, diehards who insisted on the reverse. The novelist Mrs. Gaskell, for example, told Charles Eliot Norton in July 1864, quote, I fully believe because I know you. But what facts am I to give in answer to such speech as this? It is a war forced by the government on the people, hence the, the conscription orders for enlistment are not readily or willingly, willingly responded to. Or, secondly, it is a war for territory. The pretext of slavery is only a pretext with a large majority. And then they refer to the Emancipation Proclamation only setting the slaves of rebels free. I have one person in particular in my mind who holds these opinions and uses these arguments. Such a good and noble and conscientious man, though he is so wrong-headed. He joined the Southern Association as soon as the Emancipation Proclamation was published for the reason I have given above. It's only including the slaves of rebels." Unquote. But even these holdouts were not necessarily advocating a change in the government's policy of neutrality. The celebrated southern oceanographer, Commodore Matthew Fontaine Maury, was the first among the Confederates in England to realize that the Emancipation Proclamation had struck at the heart of southern support. Quote, 
Many of our friends here have mistaken British admiration of Southern pluck and newspaper spite at Yankee insolence as Southern sympathy. No such thing, he wrote to a friend. Quote, there is no love for the South here. In its American policy, the British government fairly represents the people. There is no hope for recognition here. Therefore, I say, withdraw Mason, unquote. The truth of Maori's statement was finally made plain to James Mason when he met with Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister, on the 14th of March, 1865, in a last-ditch effort to secure British recognition of the South. Mason had been shocked when he learned that Jefferson Davis was prepared to abolish slavery in return for British recognition, and he did not want to carry out the order to relay this message to Palmerston. By Mason's own account, he prevaricated for almost 20 minutes before finally asking whether, quote, there was some latent, undisclosed obstacle on the part of Great Britain to recognition, unquote. Palmerston had already divined the real purpose of this meeting and conversation and replied without hesitating that slavery had never been the obstacle. Mason was elated until he recounted this conversation to his friend, Lord Dunamore, who told him that Palmerston had said this precisely to forestall a last-minute appeal from the South. In fact, Dunamore said slavery had always been the chief impediment to recognition. The South had squandered her only chance of achieving it by not emancipating the slaves in 1863 when Lincoln had issued his Emancipation Proclamation and Lee was the undisputed victor on the battlefield. For a brief moment, Mason feared that he had been responsible for ruining the South's last hope of survival, and he wanted to see Palmerston again so that he could be much clearer this time. But Donna Moore assured him that there was no point. The opportunity had now truly passed. The history of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in England is therefore a complex and complicated tale of bad first impressions, followed by a gradual movement away from Southern support as the public realized the asymmetry between the two sides. The South almost succeeded in turning the North's moral victory into defeat, but ultimately was unable to come up with an answer which satisfied English abolition sentiment. Although the Confederate propagandists in Britain continued to portray the South as a plucky underdog fighting for independence, without a comparable emancipation proclamation, the slavery weapon was effectively out of their reach. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's a lot to take on board coming from. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my question uh, I'm a PhD student, uh, American University, and now uh, Concordia University in Montreal history. And uh, believe it or not, I wrote a paper, a very similar subject, uh, and I titled it uh, the same, uh, Wrap the World in Fire, uh, Seward's famous words. And basically, uh, and I did most of my research, uh, Library of Congress, uh, some of the original correspondence between uh, uh, President Lincoln and, and Seward, and I really looked at that relationship between the two of them. I was kind of looking at it from the American side. And, and uh, in particular, I focused in on the Trent Incident, which uh, preceded the Emancipation Proclamation and Antietam, of course, and how close uh, the United States and uh, Britain in particular came to conflict, um, and uh, whether the U.S. was, uh, when Seward used that famous phrase, whether the United States was bluffing or not. And uh, I think and I'm going to quote from my paper, uh, William Seward, and just, just get your reaction. Um, 
But, uh, okay, the question, the question really, thank you. Uh, the question is really, uh, uh, the key was recognition of the South and uh, the battle, the real diplomatic battle between the northern states and the southern states, the other war that was being fought, not on the battlefields here in, in, uh, in the United States, but was over diplomatic recognition in France as well, Napoleon III's court, and, and uh, Adams and the American representatives did a great job uh, representing the North and fighting against sorry. southern recognition. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, it's a long lead-in. But again, my question is, how close would you say the United States and Britain came to actual conflict. And one, was Seward really bluffing? Did he and Lincoln feel like they really had, even prior to the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, the moral high ground in their, their battle against the South? And uh, was there a real possibility of the war uh, spreading? And I, I argued that, that it didn't, thanks to the personal diplomacy of Lincoln and Seward. But, uh, was it, how close did it come? How close did the United States and Britain come to conflict, is my question. Thank you, I'm sorry, no, that no, long no, lead in. I'm just no. trying to frame the context I know, it, here. It yeah. is complicated, I, 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 I do appreciate it. Well, I mean, um, you know, we've obviously got some uh, other experts in this, in this room, and probably over lunch we can have a, a discussion yeah. about the Trent Affair. Um, I, I'm one of those who genuinely believes that war was days away um, in 1861, that the troops were on their way. And I, I, I'm also on the side the, the of... The British S troops. British troops were on their way. And I'm on the side of Seward. I believe that his personal bravery um, is immense and that if nothing else, if he, if he achieved nothing else in his entire career, what he did um, it, during those lead-up days up to Christmas, um, up to the 25th on 1861, is, is, was truly the work of a patriot in bringing around not just the cabinet, but ultimately the entire country from position A all the way to position C, and let, or, or Z, and, uh, Z, and, um, and letting the, the two um, Confederate commissioners go. So I, I, that's, that is what I think, because I know from the British side that they were 100% behind the war. And in fact, they were discussing bombardment plans. We'll start with Maine, then we'll move on to New York. And Admiral Milne said, we must bring the war to them. And they were going to, they were going to bomb New York. They were going to bomb these major port cities. So yes, I think that we were very close. To be continued at lunch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in your research, did you uh, find any, any uh, suggestion that the gradual British uh, trend toward favoring the North after uh, 1863 had any impact on the diplomacy surrounding uh, and British government policy surrounding the building of Confederate raiders and warships in, in uh, British and Scottish ports? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think that um, Lord Russell's policy in um, and, and how the government worked in trying to prevent the Confederates from building their navy and their laird rams in England um, was connected to the Emancipation Proclamation only in the sense that it made their job slightly easier because they were able to bring around public opinion more on their side. But even then, for example, in, in Scottish <coughs> ports, um, uh, it was the, the Lord Provost of Glasgow said it was absolutely impossible to try to police these ports because they were bringing work to, work to unemployed workers who were furious at the prospect of, of, of losing their jobs. And so um, they, didn't, they didn't want to stop the Confederate building. And then the same thing in when the British government um, did seize the Laird Rams, they actually brought in the Marines to uh, take these lead rams out of commission. They were so feared um, riots and unrest down in Liverpool. But, uh, it, but it certainly helped. Having the Emancipation Proclamation on their side was really vital for the government and having support from the people. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, the, what influence do you think the South embargo of cotton shipment to England might have had on the British thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation? Oh, I, I think it was enormous, actually. I think that um, it was a propaganda coup for the North because uh, it, was, it was written about in England as, and perceived as a as, as tremendous insult, uh, this attempt by the South to blackmail um, Britain into recognition. 
And if anything was going to prevent the government from doing that, it was that attempt. So it, it was very much an own goal. And, you know, and it didn't work, as we know, because of the glut. Um, so, yes, that was, that was just terribly muddle-headed wrong thinking on the behalf of the South. I mean, in fact, it was catastrophic for them. Thank you. Um, this may be a little off the subject, and if so, I apologize. But I recall that in uh, Strachey's biography of uh, Queen Victoria, he gives Prince Albert credit for avoiding uh, uh, the uh, British involvement in the war on the southern side by convincing uh, Parliament to uh, tone down its response to, I guess it was a trend affair, so did this, did it actually happen the way that he said? And uh, if so, where does that fit into uh, the events? And that's such an interesting question. I think, it's, I think that Strait is absolutely true. What happened was that the, government, the, the, the cabinet had composed a letter which was going to be delivered by the British ambassador, Lords, Lord Lyons. And um, the letter was forceful, sort of arrogant, huffy. Um, it gave no room for maneuver. And, and, it, and, and, and when Prince Albert read it, he knew that the only response that the Americans could give without losing face you know, was go stuff yourselves. And so, um, <laughs> so yes, it was the, literally the very last thing that he did was that he, he, he toned it down, removed phrases and repositioned it. It was, it was Lord Russell's writing and he was um, notorious for his, being stiff and, and, and um, almost sort of socially autistic. There's a kind of, there's a, fa there's a, there's a kind of um, fa famous anecdote that he was talking to the Duchess of Argyle and they were standing by a fire and then he suddenly left her and moved over and talked, went in to speak to the Duchess of Sutherland. And, um, and someone said, went up to him and said, gosh, why did you, why did you suddenly just turn away and, and, and leave the Duchess of Argyle like that? He said, well, I mean, it was just so hot, I was getting sweaty, so I, I had to move away. And, um, and, and the friend said, well, did you tell the Duchess of Argyle that? He said, no, but I did tell the Duchess of Sutherland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just from the uh, British perspective, would have been a, a positive or a negative if the Emancipation Proclamation had been earlier? Oh, without a doubt, it would have been positive. I mean, without a doubt, it would have, it would have been a complete game changer. In fact, there's a very interesting letter that Lord Lyons, the British ambassador, wrote to um, Lord Russell um, at the very, very beginning of the war, um, in which he says, you know, my inclinations, and I know yours are the same, would be to support these men in power in every way we could. Um, but because of Seward's stance and the threats and the this and the that, we're going to have to remain neutral. But, I mean, England, at the very beginning, was, um, its, its response was very malleable. And if, they'd, if there had been that kind of slavery emancipation or proclamation or promise or whatever, it would have really been a game changer. And that isn't to criticize or whatever, but that is the case, though. Thank you. OK. Uh, my question. Uh, comes from you saying that the Scottish workers would have been mad if they lost business. What happened at the end of the war when um, the South couldn't pay England for their ships? What happened to business? Oh, well, I mean, quite a few businesses went out of, went, went under. The London Armoury, for example, the London Rifle, rifle it, was, it was one of the biggest, um, the London Rifle Association had the biggest armoury of, of rifles, and, and they had ended up really only supplying the South, and they went under. So mm. quite a few did. Um, a, a lot of the blockade running companies were actually really just, you know, merchant companies who then realized they could make more money um, blockade running. And some of them went under. Mm. Um, but, you know, I mean, the thing is, you know, the world's a big place and there's always another war somewhere. And so <laughs> most people were able just to transition. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I have uh, actually two questions. My first question is, since uh, slavery was banned in Britain in, I think, 1840 or 18... Even earlier, yes. Uh, 1820, I think. 32. Yeah, yeah. okay. What was uh, the trade relation between UK and US after that slavery ban in uh, UK earlier? Was there any trade embargoes between Britain 
and U.S. due to the slavery still going on in the South? That's the uh, one question. The second question is, since 18, in 1857, I think, uh, Queen Victoria, she dissolved East India Company, and they got full control of uh, India or subcontinent. Now, the cotton, I mean, the development of cotton in um, British India was planned. So what was the impact of uh, taking India in 1857 and making plan to get cotton from there as compared to the south over here? Okay, you're going to have to, don't go away because you might have to remind me of the second question when I've answered okay. the first one. Okay, okay. okay so the first one. Um, so. Uh, Although there were no actual trade implications after 1832 vis-a-vis -vis, um, Britain and the US because of British emancipation of its slaves that I know of, what the, there were um, ongoing diplomatic problems. The first was that uh, Britain then pursued an aggressive policy of, um, in, of, of forming alliances with all major powers uh, to have an agreement that they could search suspected slave ships. But the only country who held out was the US. And so the slave trade was essentially carried on by American, in American ships. Um, and, and even when they were foreign ships, they had the American flag because they knew they were safe. And there were several incidences, especially in the 1850s, where the British Navy had overstepped its mark. And um, in fact, there were, there were calls, but they never got that far, for war between the two countries unless there was an agreement that was maintained and Britain apologized each time it, it stopped a suspected American slave ship. On top of that, there was tremendous friction between especially the South and Britain because of, um, for example, the Duchess of Sutherland's and Lord Shaftesbury's address to the women of America um, to, uh, to uh, abolish slavery. And that was considered you know, both arrogant and wrongheaded. This, the second point um, about Indian cotton, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Um, the, the government had agreed that it was silly to be dependent on southern, southern cotton. There was a, a trade association in Manchester which was um, set up specifically to look into exploiting and improving cotton production in India. But nobody ever did anything about it. It's one of those kind of great things. You, know, you set up a commission, you have the commission, you have the report, and nobody ever follows through. I mean, it sort of just goes to show these things aren't that modern. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and so they weren't that prepared when the war started, and so they, there was always Production, a problem of production with Indian cotton because of, it was sore at, it was a, you know, quite, wasn't as good quality, but nevertheless, I mean, it's certainly really, that's what it obviously, as you know, Indian cotton got going. Okay, thank you. It's my understanding that the British cabinet was on the verge of recommending uh, uh, acknowledgement and recognition of the Confederacy after the defeats of the Union Army at the Second Bull Run and earlier on the Peninsular Campaign. And that Palmerston, the, the uh, prime minister, said, well, let's just wait and see how the military situation evolves. So just calm your jets. And um, suppose that uh, McClellan had lost the Battle of Antietam. Do you suppose that Britain would have then intervened on behalf of the Confederacy? Um, it, no, because I, don't, I personally don't think that. Um, th this is one of those things where it's, it's a, it's a never-ending argument, you know, how many angels can dance in the head of a pin, because, you know, you, you, you end up looking at people's diaries, you know, we, it's basically 12 people, what did they think and what did they do? And um, we, we obviously, William, uh, Lord, Lord Russell and William Gladstone were absolutely on the side of recognition. Um, then we have the, the, the don't knows and then the abs absolute naysayers, and that's um, Corn, uh, um, Cornwall, Sir George Cornwall Lewis, um, the Duke of Argyll, um, and then a few others in the middle. And, um, and I, don't, I don't think that those positions were going to change. So you always have deadlock. And whenever there's a deadlock in, in, in the cabinet, generally the, the decision is then to stay on the side of inertia. Um, so just British practice, you know. Uh, um, so, so for that and other reasons, I, I, I don't think so. This is not a question, just I want to back up your, your statement. I heard a paper delivered on the U.S. and British naval relations. I forget the name of the squadron that was based in Bermuda, but because of your Royal Navy Rear Admiral, several war-like war incidents were avoided, especially Commodore Wilkes, because of the tact of the Admiral. 
the British Rear Admiral in command. I can't remember his name, but I'm sure you know who he is. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, Admiral Milne was rather admirable, actually, um, and Wilkes. But, I mean, are the British, some of the British admirals in, who, who were knocking, some of the British naval commanders who were knocking around in the um, North Atlantic British squadron were um, somewhat culpable in, in, in provoking. I mean, for example, you know, I can't quite remember off the top of my head the name of the ship, but when it got, the British ship got in, in um, within earshot of a U.S., Naval ship, it started playing Dixie, you know. I mean, it's not, it's not going to win friends, you know. <laughs> that, that, that was the beginning of the special relationship, don't you see? They, they were appropriating American musical tunes. So special. Anyway. Um, um, by the way, there's a famous painting of uh, Bermuda at the height and also the Bahamas, the blockade, uh, both Nassau and Bermuda, the blockade runners were going in there. And I think it's not until 1864 that the Royal Navy stops letting them, them uh, station there or whatever. But there t I, I know the painting of uh, Bermuda, I think they're about, it shows about 50 blockade runners in the port with the, the Union Jack in the background on shore and on a, on a, on a couple of men of war as well. No, I mean, it, it is extraordinary, but then you mustn't forget that, um, you know, again, doing, the Caribbean was so poor that, you know, the, the government was sort of somewhat loath to interfere in what was essentially, you know, a lifesaver for these islands. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.